Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Miriam Gottfried, and I'm a reporter at the Wall Street Journal. And I have with me here Jonathan Friedland, a partner at Sugar Felsenthal, and an expert in Chapter 11 bankruptcy, which is what he's going to talk to us about today. Hi, Jonathan. Hi. Every, everybody's favorite topic, right? Exactly. Um, so we are going to start off with um, some pretty basic questions and then move into maybe more complex questions. Um, and um, you wanna take us to the first question? Oh, here's a little background about the webinar first. Okay, so our first question is, as I said, a pretty basic one. When a company is in financial trouble, what are its options? And what can it do? And I'm hoping, John, you can explain this beautiful chart you have here. I hope so. I wrote it. Uh, so if uh, your company is financially distressed uh, and you're thinking about all of the potential alternatives that you can use uh, to your advantage, there they appear under the circle alternatives for, for debtor. Uh, if you want to think about what your adversaries, your creditors may do um, host, in a you know hostile fashion against your company, you look to the against debtor circle. Right now, without any regard to which of these options make sense for your company because it's going to depend on the facts. Let me just quickly run through the alternatives for the debtor. So broad brush, an out of court restructuring is anything ranging from, uh, let's say, you know, Bob's Burgers has, uh, you know, five locations and it knows it's in trouble. It, and it's got you know five large vendors and a bank. Uh, Bob can get those people in a room. I mean, COVID aside, they, he can literally get those people in a room. And if they can work something out, that's an out-of-court workout. If you go to the polar opposite extreme in terms of you know size of business, a a, a debt exchange, an exchange offer that large uh, companies with publicly traded securities uh, do all the time outside of bankruptcy is also an out of court restructuring. So it's a broad category, you know, the category is broad and it covers, um, you know, both of those situations and everything in between. If the only um, purpose of the lawyers is to paper the business deal. You know, there's no resort to statutes. There's no resort to court. A, a friendly Article 9 surrender and satisfaction. That Article 9 refers to Article 9 of the Uniform Commercial Code. And um, the Uniform Commercial Code is a model law that's been adopted by all 50 states many years ago. And um, Article 9 governs the, um, it gov governs how a company or a person, uh, but how a company can pledge collateral to secure its obligations, to secure a loan. Uh, it governs how, uh, it, how these um, liens arise and it governs how a creditor uh, forecloses on the lien if, if that's what the creditor um, has the right to do and wants to try to do and you know everything in between. Um, Article nine, if you look on the other side of the slide, it's also on that uh, side. And the reason is that primarily when, when you hear the term, I'm being foreclosed upon under Article nine, 
that's a bad thing, right? Doesn't sound good. <laughs> uh, how, however, for reasons that uh, I think we'll get into, but I, I'm going to really try to four corner each each you know question so that we don't bleed um, in, into subsequent questions. Uh, there are reasons why the owner or owners of a company may agree to basically stand down and rather than fight the Article 9 um, by not cooperating, by defending against the lawsuit, or by filing bankruptcy, uh, may lay down and say, we're, we're going to cooperate. Um, and that's the, that's the concept of Article 9, friendly Article 9. Um, an assignment for the benefit of creditors, in a lot of ways, looks like a Chapter 7 bankruptcy. As someone who advises on the company side, um, everything from you know small businesses to private PE owned, private equity owned businesses, and everything in between, um, it is a rare situation, uh, I'd say industry-wide, and, and I think to date in my personal practice over 25 years, wow, um, I'm old, uh, that, I've, that I've counseled a client, let's put this company into chapter seven. Um, and that's in part because of the availability of this other remedy, an EBC, in most states. And as I said, the the ABC looks a lot like a Chapter Seven in and in the following way: um, the in a Chapter Seven, a Chapter Seven trustee is is appointed by uh, the government. Um, the United States Trustees Office is a division of the U.S. Department of Justice, and the, each local United States Trustees Office effectively contracts, uh, usually with lawyers, bankruptcy lawyers usually, who serve as chapter seven panel trustees. And each one gets handed a number of cases every month to administer as the chapter seven trustee. Most of these cases are consumer cases with no assets. And uh, they're kind of, what's the uh, term of art, loss leaders because the, the quote unquote juicy cases where a trustee can actually make some money is in where there's a business case with assets. And um, for better and or for worse, oftentimes a primary asset that a chapter seven trustee will look to is some sort of litigation claim against directors, officers, and owners. Um, the assignment for the benefit of creditors also involves a trustee um, of a trust, and that trustee is uh, that trust is made for the for the benefit of creditors. Uh, it, but but the nomenclature is usually assignee. We just for whatever reason we we call the, the it's a, an assignee slash trustee, and we refer to the it as an assignee. It's an easier way to distinguish from a Chapter Seven trustee. Both the seven trustee and the assignee and an ABC are charged with um, bringing together uh, all of a company, all the company's assets, uh, and and selling them for highest and best, and then distributing the proceeds to creditors. Um, and a, the, a form of liquidation. They're both forms of liquidation. Mm -hmm. uh, a key difference is the company, the shareholders of the company. Uh, get to typically in most states, um, or you know, sometimes it's the board, um, get to appoint the assignee. Um, so rather than getting a random chapter seven trustee, you get to appoint your own assignee. And um, there is a cottage industry of assignees that exists. And uh, they have duties to creditors just like a chapter seven trustee does. Um, but at least in some circles, there's a view that assignees are often better because rather than being lawyers, typically they're business people. Um, and in an assignment, it's, it's pretty common to keep the business running 
as a going concern and to sell the business as a going concern. Whereas in chapter seven, that's rare. It's possible, it happens, but it's rare. Um, so th there are situations where a chapter seven liquidate, a, trust, a, a, a filing of a chapter seven can make sense, but uh, more often than not, and in, in, at least in the totality of my experience, uh, where available, an ABC has made more sense. And then we have our our topic du jour, which is the chapter 11. That's right. And see, I smile at it. I just get so giddy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, so so chapter 11, the title of chapter 11 is reorganization. The title of chapter seven is liquidation. Um, if you are a company and you're not a bank or a railroad, um, but if you're because they uh, banks are governed differently for purposes of insolvency and railroads have their own chapter of the bankruptcy code. Uh, municipalities have their own chapter of the bankruptcy code. Um, if you're an individual human being, you can file chapter 7, 13, or 11. If you're a company, you're going to file a 7 or an 11. Those are your two main choices, although uh, once you decide, if you decide to file an 11, you um, then have a, a number of uh, subsequent choices to make because there are different kinds of 11s. Um, and and the, the one thing we should take away from this slide about chapter 11 is that it, um, it is titled reorganization but as anybody who has followed chapter 11 cases knows they're not always reorganizations they're commonly often filed for the purpose of liquidating or for either liquidating and piecemeal the assets of the company or selling the company as a going concern and um and sometimes they are filed with the intention, the goal of reorganizing, but the reorganization efforts fail and it turns into a liquidation. And if and when that happens, it doesn't mean it converts to seven. Li chapter, li uh, chapter 11 liquidations are, are common. We're ready to move on to the next question. So you got you kind of got into this question a little bit, but if if I'm a company in distress, what are the major factors that I need to consider in terms of deciding which of these alternatives I'm going to pursue? So I'll run through uh, some of these bullets, the ones that strike my fancy here and now, and I'll elaborate on them. Um, so let's go back to Bob's Burgers. That was a small burger chain, you know, three, four locations, let's say. All else being equal, I don't need to know anything more than just that to say, okay, uh, uh, we're really going to try to avoid an 11 or a traditional chapter 11. Why? Because of the expense. Bottom line, the expense. Um, you know, and by the way, I said all else being equal, right? Um, so that one data point doesn't doesn't just make is not outcome determinative, but it it absolutely is is pretty relevant and causes uh, the uh, a lawyer, or at least me, to know immediately what subsequent questions I want to get into. It takes me into a you know a particular path of questioning, so. Um, and well, we're going to get into why it's expensive later, right? Sure, if you yeah. like. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think it's it's a little ironic, you know, that here's a company that is, you know, insolvent and here and then one of the major options that it faces for how to restructure is a very expensive option, right? Which, you know, we already know that it's having trouble with its finances. So Yeah, and years ago it wasn't the case. Um, but Certainly today and certainly over the last couple of decades, it, it's become very expensive. Another thing that we will, um, at least the prepared slides tell us we'll get to, is um, the topic of subchapter five of chapter 11, which is, um, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful thing from the perspective of the small company 
that would like to file chapter 11, but chapter 11 is just too expensive. If your creditors are very loyal um, to you, if they like you as a customer, then doing some sort of restructuring is going to be easier than if not. Again, all else being equal, right? And if um, they, if if you believe that they'll support your reasonable efforts, that may lend itself to an out of court situation. Um, if depending on the size. So again, you have Bob's Burgers, but let's multiply, let's say, you know, instead of being a 40 location chain, it's now a 400 location chain. And actually, I don't like burgers because there's no inventory. Let's switch that to Bob's Books. Um, if um, Bob's Books has four locations and they're all in the same state, that's a very different situation than if it's 400 in many states. Right away, the um, process, the, the, what chapter 11 does bring to the table, brings a lot of things to the table. But one of the things it brings to the table is it brings everybody in front of the same court. Um, it has, it, 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 because it's federal law, federal law overrides any inconsistent uh, state or local laws. The, and uh, a, a good example with the hypothetical Bob's books is that let's say the decision is to liquidate. Let's say everybody agrees, even the owners, that it's time to shut this business down. Let's um, just uh, liquidate everything and get as much money back as we can get to creditors. Or perhaps um, let's liquidate 80% of the stores and be a leaner you know, machine, uh, keeping the best stores open and um, you know, rejiggering the business a little bit better. Um, you can that can be accomplished um, through an Article Nine, through an ABC, out of court, through bankruptcy. But once you get to uh, the the size, you know, four hundred, you know, forty is is a little bit in the middle. It's a gray area. But the larger you get, the more likely it is that the costs, the, 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 the more expensive process that chapter 11 is, is worth it. Because chapter 11 brings a lot of benefits. I'll give you just one example. Um, if you remember uh, Circuit City Home Place, which was a furniture store once owned by Sears, Home Life, which used to be uh, compete with Bed Bath & Beyond, um, Musicland, which used to own Sam Goodies and a bunch of other brands in all the malls. Those are all companies I was involved in their, I, I was involved in uh, each of their bankruptcies. And one attribute of each of their bankruptcies was that they all had these massive going out of business sales at locations that closed. And you may remember seeing people wearing, you know, the streets, the, the sign walkers, you know, advertising the GOB sales. Mm. Um, doing that under the protection of bankruptcy is way easier because whether you realize it or not, uh, there's thousands of municipal laws that govern going out of business sales because in years gone by, uh, companies, fly-by-night companies used to do them um, and, and uh, you know, they were, they were somewhat fraudulent to the public. Hmm. Uh, so under the protection of, of the federal bankruptcy code, you don't have to really pay too much attention to any of those, any of those laws. I'm oversimplifying, of course, uh, but that's kind of the bottom line. So um, just touching on an others, uh, on a few other bullets, um, if you're going to have a going concern sale versus a liquidation sale, that's, you know, a major um, factor that can help drive which way you're going to go uh, for a number of reasons. I'll give one example. Um, let's say that the, um, the exit, the, the, the exit strategy, the, the, the purpose of the filing is to effect a going concern sale from owner to buyer. And by the way, just to be clear, buyer 
could be a new co who's some of whose shareholders or even all of whose shareholders are the owners of old co. Um, that's completely legitimate if, if done properly. Um, so if the transaction is old co is going to sell all of its assets to new co, then there are very good reasons to try to do that through a, a chapter 11. Um, and I'll stop saying all else being equal because that's like a standard caveat. Um, and for, for myriad reasons, but one, the most obvious reason, so if, if you're you know, a bankruptcy lawyer in the audience, which you shouldn't be, this is for journalists. <laughs> Get out of there, lawyers. Um, you, you're probably already a step ahead of my verbose words because it, it's about free and clear um, on, the, on the sale. If, um, if, if I own a business, or I'm a private equity fund that owns a business or whoever I am, you know, the owner business, owner business, right? And it has lots of debt. And I, and with the cooperation of say my senior secured lender, um, I wanna sell all of the assets to Nuco, which I also own. And let's say, I'm a, I'm, I guess I'm finding myself painting a hypothetical. Um, you know, let, let's say all of the assets of the company are legitimately worth $50 million. And let's say the secured lender is owed $100 million. That means that unsecured creditors will get nothing. Um, they're completely um, out of the money because the senior secured lender who has a lien on all assets is only gonna get paid 50 cents on the dollar. So that presents the sort of situation where owner of old co can sell assets to owner to, to, to new co, which she also, or he also owns. Um, but to do that outside of the protection of bankruptcy is um, very risky comparatively to doing it inside of bankruptcy. Um, who was it that said, I think it like was a Churchill, Churchill quote, you know, sunlight cures, something about free speech and everyone should be allowed to talk because <laughs> truth, the sunlight cures the truth or something. The point being um, you, these interested party transactions, um, which if you try to do under the cover of dark, or if you don't, don't, even if you don't intend to do them under the cover of dark, but if you don't do them correctly, including full disclosure, um, you're, you're, it's like you're, you're, you're trying to build a lawsuit against you in the future. Whereas if it's done um, under the province of a bankruptcy court where everything is properly disclosed and other parties are given a chance to bid on the assets, then it's all good. Um, but the devil's in the details. Um, let me say two more things and then I'll shut up on this slide. Uh, the existence of personal guarantees and fiduciary duties, and it's, it's kind of good to talk about them in the same breath. So public companies don't, the owners of public companies don't give personal guarantees. The last time I bought some stock, um, I didn't have to sign a personal guarantee, right? What do you mean by personal guarantee? What does that What does that term mean? Oh, thank you. So, um, bottom line is, you know, the corporate form in, in in the Western world is a beautiful thing because you know I form a corporation, the business does the corporation or the LLC does business. It has debts it can't pay. You cannot go against the owner, right? It's it's uh, it's it's a separate legal entity. And the default is unless the ownership did something wrong or unless the ownership contractually obligated themselves by issuing a personal guarantee, by giving a personal guarantee, then creditors of the company do not generally have a right to go against the owners. But the reality um, you know, on, on Main Street is that most businesses that are owned by individuals or families 
or groups of people, private equity, fund, even small, pri small private equity funds, or at least small fundless sponsors, um, there's generally you know, personal guarantees are required when you're a smaller private company. In my experience, smaller can easily mean $100 million of revenue. So you mean when, when I'm borrowing money from the bank as a small business owner, they will require me as an individual to give a personal guarantee as yeah. opposed to a public company where the company itself would be the liable party. In both instances, the company is the borrower, but in, in a privately owned company, um, the owner of the buyer, of, of the borrower will often be, uh, will often have to provide a credit enhancement by giving a personal guarantee. Got it. And, and that's when you're dealing with your bank or your secured lend, other secured lender. And it's also uh, fairly common, very common among landlords and tenants. So um, the, uh, if you have a personal guarantee, if you've given a personal guarantee, and your creditor um, is owed a lot of money and your creditor wants your distressed company to handle its distress by this alternative or using this alternative or using this alternative, if the secured lender has a personal guarantee against you personally, human nature is such that that personal guarantee, I, you know, we often, lots of people in, in, in my industry often say, it's like a gun to your head. Because if you cooperate with the, the holder of a personal guarantee, then maybe that holder of the personal guarantee will, will um, be less likely to go, go against you to actually try to collect on the guarantee. Um, but so it could change your incentives as, as somebody who's given a personal guarantee so that you might be acting in your own best interest as opposed to in the best interests of your company. That's a possibility, or at least you may, be, you may want to, mm -hmm. uh, you're tempted to. Fortunately, in real life, um, there's, it, it's not uncommon where what's best for the company is also best for you. And so the conflict uh, doesn't arise, um, and the and that's why and and now you know segueing right into fiduciary duties, you, one may the owners of a company may be inclined they may recognize, you know because they're not stupid yes you know I understand that the holder of the guarantee wants me to do X, but a well-advised, or I should say, even a oh, slightly, ad just adequately advised um, company and its owner will be made aware by its attorneys that you can't just be the puppet of who hap whoever happens to own a personal guarantee against you or has other leverage against you because you have fiduciary duties that you have to comply with um, to all creditors and other stakeholders. And if you don't do it, if you, if you breach your fiduciary duties, your personal guarantee liability may become the least of your problems because you're opening up yourself up to a world of hurt in the form of lawsuits. Um, and then I'll just say that management's criticality, um, that, that's simply shorthand for if, you know, if there's a widget company and the widget company is owned wholly or in part by an operator, maybe it's just, you know, a, a guy and um, uh, he owns and operates it, he's the CEO, founder, or maybe uh, he has brought in a private equity partner, whatever. The point is, if ownership and management are in somewhat of the same body or bodies, and it's a widget factory, and it's very easy to run, um, there's no magic to it, um, the management can go on vacation for a month and nothing's going to matter, then that's one situation. If the... Um, 
owners slash managers include people who without the company would absolutely fall down and, and be worth nothing, then that management becomes much more critical. And, and that's, that's power, right? Um, okay, I'll shut up on this slide unless you want to ask anything else. No, I think, I think you've covered it. Let's move on. So another pretty basic question, but what does it actually mean when a company files for chapter 11? So first of all, again, chapter 11 is part of the bankruptcy code and there's other chapters. Um, seven, I told, I said earlier, seven, nine, 11, 13, um, 12 for farmers, family farmers, um, 15 for foreign companies who, who, um, anyway, there are these chapters and each one is for a different type of party. The bottom line is that, that bankruptcy is governed by the bankruptcy code, but is interpreted by courts, right? Um, the bankruptcy code is, would, would, it's not the tax code, it's not 10,000 pages. So there's a lot of um, interpretation that's been done over the years by bankruptcy courts. Um, anyway, so what does it mean to file an 11? Well, the minute you file an 11, um, you become a debtor, a debtor in possession um, in, in bankruptcy, and you're bestowed with a whole bunch of powers and rights and obligations that you didn't have before. Um, you, you um, and, and as the bottom says on this slide six, you get a respite. Uh, in the form of, an, of the automatic stay, um, which means that you uh, any any litigation that was pending against your company, any execution of a judgment that was just, was uh, was about to take place, um, any act to recover on pre-petition, that is pre-bankruptcy debts is stayed automatically upon the filing of the case. And it provides a good respite in some situations. Um, what's that expression? A death by death by a thousand cuts. Um, where, you know, let's say you're defending against hundreds of lawsuits and just the cost of defense is killing you. Um, bankruptcy will stop that um, period right away. Now it's not forever. Uh, creditors can get relief from the stay. There's a process for that. Um, bankruptcy also, and I'm, I'm again, I'm focused on the bottom bullet point. Um, bankruptcy chapter 11 also provides uh, the ability to rehabilitate because it, it again, it, it, it gives a debtor powers that, uh, rights, powers that simply don't exist outside of bankruptcy. Um, very briefly, because I think the goal is to talk about to, about on some slides about them specifically, but um, the power to bind your creditors and other equity holders, um, for that matter, to a deal. Um, I, I, I didn't say this earlier, and I let me use this uh, earlier slide. You now, what drives strategy? So one thing I, I, I neglected to mention is, um, let's say you have um, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000 creditors, it doesn't matter what number. And let's go with 100. Um, and 85 of them are on board, 85 of them. And, and the 85 of them, let's say that, you know, not every, every creditor is owed the same amount of money let's say 85 of them are on board and 85 of them are owed 90% uh, of what your company owes. Um, out of court, you have them around a table. It's a big table, I guess. And they all say, we're, we're, we're on board. Well, um, what about the ones who are not on board? They're, it's, it's a holdout problem. Um, they simply won't agree. So if the Assuming the other creditors can get over the unfairness of, of holdouts getting more because they're not willing to negotiate, 
and also assuming that the amount of the, you know, when I talk about a deal, I'm talking about, um, I didn't say it aloud, I probably should. Let's say the deal is that these, you know, the, the, these, this majority of creditors is willing to say, all right, look, pay us back 75 cents on the dollar and we'll give you five years to pay it back. So the vast majority of, of creditors are willing to do that, but a, but a minority or not, they're holding out. Um, assuming the other creditors who are agreeable can get the bad taste out of their mouth by possibly just you know letting these few holdouts uh, get a hundred cents because they're not agreeing voluntarily to restructure. And assuming further that the company, the debtor, looks at the math and says, okay, I can work with that. I was hoping to get my debt down to this, but getting it down to this is okay. Then that's fine. You can do it out of court. Um, but if you don't, if, if you can't make those things, two things true, then you can file bankruptcy and assuming you can satisfy certain tests, you can basically, um, you can run over steamroll over those those dissenting creditors because there's a, if you have the requisite majorities and other tests are satisfied so uh what does it mean when a company files chapter 11 one it means the company was hurting two it does not mean the company is insolvent you don't have to be insolvent to file chapter 11. um three it means that the company decided after a lot of consideration, the chapter 11, because it's, it's a serious thing. Um, it's, it's, bet the, it's effectively bet the company litigation um, that this was the best path. And it means it's gonna get some powerful tools to try to help, the help itself get to the, whatever goal it's trying to get to, whether that's a sale, a totally legitimate goal, or whether it's a true classic reorganization uh, that's what it means when a company, you know, broadest brush, uh, what it means when a, a company files chapter 11. More, less? We, we had one question from um, the audience, which you might be getting to, I don't know, when we talk about a little bit more about the automatic stay, but the question was, what is the difference between an automatic stay under chapter 11 and chapter 15? Uh, let me try to get to that later. I want to stay. Okay. On. So, um, what is a first day motion? This is kind of the very beginning of the Chapter Eleven process, right? It, it's the formal beginning of of the process. Although usually, always, um, if there are first day motions, it means by necessity there was a lot of work prior. To <laughs> yeah, uh, just deciding to file and yeah. and all of that. Yeah. Um, so a first day motion is a motion as the name implies is filed, um, on the first day of the case and, and you know, maybe it's filed on the second day of the case. Um, and usually, uh, as, as the company is large, if the company is larger, it usually will, will commonly require more first day motions. If it's smaller, it may require, it may require fewer. Um, and when we talk about the first day of a case, we mean the petition date, the date that the chapter 11 petition is filed. By the way, we're only talking about voluntary chapter 11 uh, today. Uh, we're not touching upon, well, there's a lot of things we're not touching upon, one of which is involuntary bankruptcy. So when a company files chapter 11, what it actually really means is it, it files a voluntary petition. And it's upon the filing of that petition that the automatic stay comes into place. So, and that's a good thing because it imposes the automatic stay, but it's a bad thing because it imposes the automatic stay. And what I mean is, and um, uh, I hope it's not insensitive to use this as, a, as a, an example by way of analogy, um, I have always thought of it like uh, chemotherapy. Uh, my understanding of chemotherapy is it's powerful medicine that can kill cancer cells, but it's also so powerful that it kills the good cells. And so it can make the person sick, right? So a first day motion is necessary. There are different species of first day motions. 
But as a general proposition, um, one of the main reasons, the reason why many of the first day motions is necessary um, is because of the automatic stay. Because the automatic stay says, as, as we talked about before, hey, creditors, stand down put the guns you know in your belt you can't do anything without there's an automatic stay now and um uh if you don't like it you can come and and jump through certain hoops in bankruptcy court to get relief from the stay if, if you're eligible but you know you cannot get a dime from this debtor um uh right now and that rule is subject to exceptions um but that's the general rule but the medicine of the automatic stay is stronger because it also says, oh, by the way, debtor, that goes to you. That applies to you too. You you can't pay somebody just because you want to. You can't pay any pre-petition debts. Didn't you get the memo? And um, the uh, and that's the default. So in in real life, what that means is you have a factory of a thousand people. They're paid in arrears by two weeks last pay payday was like almost two weeks ago uh let's say payday is on friday uh adp or whatever you know out out service you, you fund payroll on thursday pay, paydays on friday you fund it on thursday you file bankruptcy on tuesday you file bankruptcy on tuesday you can't pay your people and if that happens then you just didn't pay them for almost two weeks worth of work um, which can be pretty disastrous if people like nobody comes to the factory the next day. That's bad for everybody, right? Um, it's also bad policy because now you have 2,000 people showing up at the unemployment office. So the concept of one first day motion is to take the obvious stuff and say, Judge, the bankruptcy code, you know, it, it says we can't do this, but, you know, as you've done, as bankruptcy courts have done in, virtually every other chapter 11 case ever filed since the dawn of chapter 11 in 1978. May, may we please pay these claims? And the court, I don't know of any court that's ever said no. I don't know of any creditors that really have objected. Um, some things are just so obvious. I personally think, this is an aside, that um, the only reason it hasn't just been drafted into the code is because it's like, a, what do they call it? Um, uh, an empl a full employment statute for us bankruptcy lawyers. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, getting back to task, that's the concept. And in some cases, in the example I gave you, it's super obvious that it should be done. Now, there's other things that some debtors will stick in their, for their wage, we call it the wage motion. Um, back in the day, in addition to paying those 2,000 factory workers, it also said, oh, by the way, we're going to keep, we're going to pay the CEO and the board what we owe them for the last X number of weeks or months. And courts typically would say, um, when that first started happening, uh, they, they would say, okay, well, we'll, we'll approve the order, the, the, the form of draft order you submitted, counsel, except we're going to strike that part. That's nonsense. That's not, maybe it's appropriate, but it's not necessary on the first day. Um, by now, the CEO can wait to get paid. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think the CEO is going anywhere, counsel. And by the way, I don't think he's going to wind up on the, uh, you know, on welfare tomorrow if he or she doesn't get paid. It can wait. Um, and it's not to say it's not, maybe it will get approved depending on the facts and circumstances, but not on the first, not in the context of first day. First day is meant to be very triage. And by the way, one reason it's meant to be triage is, um, who do you think has notice of the first day hearing? Very few people. Um, when you file a chapter 11 petition, uh, one of the things you have to do is you have to list your top X number of creditors. Usually it's 20, the top 20 larger companies will just number to do 30 or 40 or 50 largest general unsecured creditors. And they get, um, they get notice, as good notice as they can get. I mean, hopefully you have email addresses for all of them. Um, and they get notice of the first day hearing and all the parties that you may have been working with behind the scenes beforehand will get notice. Your bank's going to get notice. If you have bondholders, the, the indenture trustee will get notice. But there's probably thousands in a, in a larger case. And well, let's just stick with what 
uh, the example I just ginned up, um, I, we were talking about a factory with 2,000 workers. So we can assume that a factory of 2,000 workers probably has more than more than a handful of creditors. Mm -hmm. So very few parties have actual notice of the first day hearing. And so the relief uh, that is granted on the first, at, at the quote unquote first day hearings, it tends, is, is very limited. It's limited to that which a court thinks is absolutely essential to allow the company to live and really accomplish what its real goals are. Um, so in the context of um, uh, the first day motion on wages, that was an example that was, you know, with the, the 2000 line workers, that's obvious. Something less obvious, um, not the polar opposite, but it's the same concept, but less obvious that it should be granted is what is typically referred to as either critical trade or essential trade, where you say to the judge, judge, um, we have, we owe lots of creditors, lots of vendors, unsecured vendors, lots of money, but there's a few that not only do we owe them lots of money, but two, we don't have an enforceable contract again with them. It's like more of like an open order thing. Um, and three, we need them. We need them or we shut down. It's like that time I, I restructured the, I'm smiling, uh, the DeLorean time machine company. And there was- You only did? Wow, that's a pretty cool company. <laughs> yeah, Michael Fox, Jay Fox was terrific. And um, the only supplier of the flux capacitator, which made the time machine element work, was this this professor, what's his name's company? He was sole source. And if he didn't supply us, we were dead, um, dead on arrival. And so when you have situations like that, and it doesn't need to be that extreme or made up, um, shouldn't be made up, um, then a court will is able to say, okay, you know, we're gonna make an exception. You're first day motion, critical trade motion, or essential trade or essential vendor motion, you know, is granted. Um, we could have a whole webinar on, you know, just the, that topic. Anyway, it would be boring after for most people, but I, I would have a ball. Anyway, um, so that's another example of a first day motion. And um, the last bullet, I'll just quickly mention that one of the non-lawyerly things that uh, experienced counsel have to be able to help with is, um, is uh, communications, um, whether it's, it's communications to your employees, to your vendors, to your customers, to the press, if it's a company. That's yeah, I was going to say, don't forget reporters. Right. Um, and it all is very important. Um, reporters are very important. And I, again, not, not for the four corners of this slide or this webinar, but um, report, uh, the media has had absolutely real impact in some cases I've been involved in. Um, and the bottom line is there is a cottage industry of um, either crisis PR firms uh, crisis communication firms or PR firms that have a crisis communication, you know, department all, specialty. All, we, all of us reporters know them all too well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for smaller situations, and when I say smaller, I don't mean teeny. You know, if you're a company with $100 million in revenue, $50 million, $100 million or less, I'm making up, you know, a rough number, um, unless you happen to be, there are some brands that are much, they're, their brand, uh, uh, the, knowledge, the knowledge of their brand is much larger than their actual balance sheet or income statement would suggest. So sometimes a small company, it makes sense for them to hire uh, a outside uh, crisis communication firm or group. But in the vast majority of cases on, you know, on main streets across the United States, it, it doesn't make sense and the lawyers do the job. Um, because they've been lived through a lawyer who's lived through it five times learns how to do it. Um, maybe not uh, quite as as sophisticated um, and and shiny, but you know, um, not every painting can afford to be a Picasso. You got to use what you got. Um, so, oh, the slide was turned for us. Okay, here we go. So. 
this this question is what are the differences between a pre-pack a pre-arranged and pre-fall chapter 11 so these are sort of the three main types of chapter 11. so a pre-pack is where most of the case is front-ended uh prior to the filing it's like an iceberg and they say you know nine tenths of an iceberg is underwater well nine tenths of the work was done prior to the filing uh, you might be working on lawyers and, and business people might be working on pre, a prepack for a year before it gets filed. And it used to be the prepacks could get confirmed from the moment you file the chapter 11 petition to the moment of confirmation would be 40, 60 days, which was viewed as a miracle. Uh, lately, um, there's been what I can only assume is, is a a, a series of um, off the record bets about, you know, between bankruptcy attorneys about how fast they can confirm a prepack. Um, uh, a number, a few years ago, I think it was like in 19, uh, Full Beauty, um, it's on the slide, did it in three days. Um, SunGuard did it uh, more recently in somewhere between 19 and 24 hours. I wasn't wow. involved in either of those. And the reason it's 19 to 24. I wasn't involved in them and I, did, I certainly didn't have the time to do the full research. Um, so I took a quick Google, right? And some articles said 19 and some articles said 24. Um, and I suspect that the articles that said 24 might have been planted, I don't really mean that, by <laughs> the lawyers who did Belk. Um, I think Belk might have been my former firm, uh, 20 hours. I think that might be the record. And that, that happened. Um, that happened this year. As, year, as new as the year is, I think that happened just a couple, like a month or two ago. Um, and the point is that, that all of the creditors that are necessary to make a deal, all the creditors who have to make concessions, who, who need to make concessions in order to get a deal done uh, are brought together, um, usually not literally, you know, in person, but, um, you know, they're brought together and they, negotiate and actually vote upon a plan prior to the filing. And then on the first day, you usually don't even need the typical first day motions. Instead, you're presenting your plan and you're asking the judge to confirm it pretty much right away. And you run through all of the requirements of confirmation to show the judge see all these requirements have been satisfied. Um, that's a prepack. A prearranged is usually uh, the situation is, no, I'm not going to say usually. Sometimes the situation is that the there was an effort to get to a prepack, but they couldn't get there and it was otherwise time to file for other reasons. They, they ran, you know, maybe the company was out of money or whatever. And so they had a file and there was some level of agreement upon what the plan would look like. Uh, there might have even been uh, the terms of art in the parentheticals in the second bullet, plan support agreements or plan or restructuring support agreements um, signed by certain of the parties to uh, obligate themselves to, you know, act in a certain way, um, vote in a certain way in, in the 11. Um, and so the case is filed with a level of real um, agreement between at least some of the parties. And what's not a prepack or prearranged by, by by you know default is everything else, and everything else for reasons that um, well I've never liked the term free fall, but it's it's it definitely doesn't sound good. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's awfully negative and and sure in a perfect world um, it would be better to you know the other two are are going to be generally better, but um, sometimes a company's issues are issues that cannot be resolved simply by uh, getting creditors around the table. Um, you may need, um, you, you may have litigation pressure, you know, like that WR Grace example. Um, there was no, no prepack was gonna ever happen. Um, you know, tr trade creditors uh, overlook, you know, when you, when you tend, when your AR becomes past due, 30 days, past due and then 60 and then 90 trade creditors will t tend to turn you off 
And then if you're not reply, you know, you're not receiving the, the you know, raw product or materials or services you need to produce what you produce, the machinery stops, whether it's literal machinery or figurative. And so, um, you know, you may have to file and that's a free fall. It's anything that's not the other two. It's, it's by far the most common. And, um, and uh, you know, I just hate the name, but who cares what I think? <laughs> oh, our slides are, I guess we're running low on time. Our slides are being turned for us. Um, so this question is, what does it mean to be the fulcrum security? And I'm glad we've gotten to this question because it's a pretty important part of chapter 11. Yeah. Um, so let's look at the example first. Companies worth three, ten, ten million dollars. Secured lenders owed nine million dollars. And and valuation, oh, it says it right on the side. Value is in the, the eye of the beholder. Quick frolic and detour for like a hugely important point. Um, valuation can be everything in a chapter 11. A lot of important outcomes um, occurred because there were two experts who took the stand, one for the secured lenders, one for the bondholders, one for the bondholders, one for the equity or the debtor, uh, two competing valuation experts. And they, they, um, testified based on their valuation report that the company's work was worth X or the company was worth Y. Um, let's assume that there is no quite, let's, let's make the very unrealistic assumption that there is no question of value. It's stipulated that a company is worth $10 million and that a secured lender is owed $9 million. So, um, and the unsecured creditors are owed $5 million. It doesn't take an actuary to figure out that there is really no value left for equity. Equity is out of the money. In fact, the unsecured creditors are out of the money because there's a million dollars left to pay $5 million of claims. Now, equity can try to make a deal with the unsecureds where they consensually agree to allow equity to stay in place and agree to a plan over which, uh, which would pay the unsecureds uh, in full over time, or, or le excuse me, less than full over time. They can, people can agree to whatever they want to agree to. But if the unsecureds do not agree, um, they can end up owning the company. And because that's the reality, whether they keep end up owning it or not, but given what the, this math is, this math makes in this example, these unsecured creditors, the fulcrum security. That's what the fulcrum security is. It's the it's the point in the capital structure um, that if uh, where where the money runs out, if you're going to distribute it based on uh, strict uh, priority of distributions. And uh, as a result, those people can have a lot of power in a bankruptcy situation. That that's right. That's right. Um, oh. There's a parenthetical in the first bullet point that is, I guess it's related because it's in this, it's on this slide, but related or not, it's, it's a point that I want to make. Um, getting back to pre-packs and pre-arranged, um, generally speaking, a pre-pack and a pre-arranged is thought to deal, is, 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 is generally considered to be the medicine you need if you need a balance sheet restructuring. If your business is fine and you don't need to um, use other powers of the bankruptcy code, like the power to reject uh, bad le you know, leases that you don't want and executory contracts you don't want, then, um, then you know, the, the, the um, the pre-pack is, is a good goal to, to strive for. However, that's not the same as saying that in the context of a pre-pack, you can't do some of those things. Just like you can get bondholders or a bank around the table, you can get landlords around the table. So that's just one point I wanted to make. And then the other piece of this parenthetical is, um, when, when there's an indisputable fulcrum security, that means that it's gonna be an easier prepack. And again, it all comes down to value. If there's fundamental disagreements about where the fulcrum is, um, then 
there's not going to be an agreement pre-petition. Uh, people are going to, the parties are going to, you know, take their chance with, you know, with what the judge says, because they're going to argue over value. Um, anything, you want to go to the next so, slide? Yeah, let's go on to the next slide. But just to sum up, it sounds like the value is what helps you determine where the fulcrum security is. And if there's dispute over the value, then there's dispute over the fulcrum security. That's perfectly stated. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, so this question is, what is the absolute priority rule? And you mentioned this rule before, but I think, but maybe you can go into a little bit more about what it, what it means. Yeah, so, and it means two very different things dependent on if you're in traditional chapter 11 or sub chapter five, chapter 11. Um, what, what Congress did with sub, in creating sub chapter five was again, um, I mean, it was really nothing short of ama amazing. Um, and in, in the sense that in what it did to the absolute priority rule with respect to general unsecured creditors. But let's see if we can get there. And let me, for, you know, let me address this slide uh, in the context of a traditional chapter 11, the absolute priority rule um, basically stands for the proposition that um, junior creditors and equity interests cannot take anything under a plan um, until the class above them gets paid in full, unless the junior classes agree to that different treatment. I think if you read all the words on the slide, that's what the slide will say. Um, I like to think of it as, oh, and that's this is on the slide too in sub bullet one, rungs on a ladder, right? And the highest cl uh, class leaving secured claims over here. But in terms of once you've taken care of your, your, your secured claims, you, you have value left to distribute uh, either in the form of cash if the, if the case is liquidating or in the form of um, claims and equity interest if the, if the case is reorganizing, uh, the claims will be paid in the future pursuant to the plan. Um, and, and, and so you have these rungs on the ladder and administrative claims, which are uh, basically all of the expenses of the chapter 11 case, including professional fees, that's the highest um, you know, priority. I won't make the joke about it, it's too easy of a target about lawyers writing the law, right? Um, <laughs> lawyers make sure they get paid. <laughs> yeah, the administrative priority claims come other priority claims. And there's a bankruptcy code sections that governs what are these claims and what is their priority. Uh, first, second priority after administrative, second priority is to this, third priority is this, fourth priority is this, fifth priority is this. If you look at the code actually, um, because the bankruptcy code, the 20 second frolic and detour, the code section on priorities is not an 11. It's in um, it's in uh, uh, three, I guess, ch chapter, I think it's in chapter three. Um, it's in one, three or five, three. Anyway, it's a rule of general applicability. It applies to chapter seven and 11. It applies to Joe, you know, Joe Schmo on the street and it applies to, you know, any billion dollar company that files. So the very first priority, if you look at the code is has nothing to do with corporate America. It's like some kind of a personal claim, you know, that only a person would have against her or him. But for our purposes, uh, administrative claims come first, other priorities, and then uh, general unsecured claims, then any unsecured claims that have been subordinated, and then equity interests and of course, you know, preferred classes ahead of common. And so the point is that, um, and often what happens is, uh, you know, the, there won't be enough to pay um, unsecured creditors in full. And if the unsecured class doesn't agree otherwise, that means equity gets nothing. Um, if that was what often happened, then um, companies might be less inclined to file chapter 11, uh, but there are, um, there are exceptions and there are, you know, you can negotiate a different result. And the, the main exception, uh, it's the, the term is in the last line of the last bullet point. It's the new value exception. Um, and so there are ways that um, to, to get to 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 keep your uh, to get a distribution, notwithstanding the fact that it's not in absolute priority, the order of absolute priority. Uh, a whole different topic would be the the topic of gifting. Uh, can a cl senior class 
simply say, I could have gotten everything, but I'm gonna give some of my distribution to the class, two classes below me. The middle class will be saying, you can't do that. The senior class will say, sure I can, it's my money. You wouldn't have gotten it anyway. It would not have gotten it anyway. And then the middle class in between will say, you can't do it. And case law goes, um, you know, different different ways on that. And, and by the way, uh, a later slide, if we get to it, um, asks, well, how do you pick venue? How do you decide where to file? Well, you, you study, you think about what legal issues may be very important. Then you figure out, have these legal issues been decided differently in Delaware versus Texas versus Chicago versus New York? And you try to file where the legal issues tend are likely to come out the way you want them to come out. So I think we're at the 115, well, 115 Eastern time mark. So that that is the the full time that we've allotted. Do we want to go do another question or end right now? Um, well, listen, you know, this is going to be made available on demand, I think um, they, they said. And so audience, you may leave. We will not know. <laughs> we will not be insulted. We will not know. You shouldn't care if we're insulted. That means we're too sensitive. Um, <laughs> I have a little time. You have a little time. Why don't we keep going? And if people want to stick around, that's great. And if um, if not, I think as a matter of course, the I think the producer is planning on, uh, I think we're planning on um, sending some kind of notification to everyone who registered, hey, you can get this. Um, so let's keep going. Okay, I have time for another question, I think. Okay. Okay, great. And it doesn't need, does it, do you want it to be this slide or do you want to talk about something else? Um, I don't know, you put them in order of importance, so why don't we talk about this slide? Okay. So um, the, the concept is, so we were just talking about an element of plan confirmation. We were talking about um, the, the, the absolute priority rule and you see that one slide wasn't sufficient to really get the concept out even in a you know, fundamental way. So this slide per, starts to give us context. And, it's, and if you look at the bottom, there's the mention of the absolute priority rule. So the concept is that um, if you wanna confirm a plan, you gotta look at a, a non-traditional, excuse me, a, a traditional chapter 11 as opposed to a sub five. Sub five, you gotta look at new code section 1191. Um, everyone else, every other debtor has to look at 1129. And 1129 uh, delineates the test for confirmation. And a, a debtor can, can confirm a plan. And by the way, that's shorthand because even though in the vast majority of situations, it's the debtor who files the plan, which makes the debtor the plan proponent, there are cases where the debtor is not the plan proponent and somebody else files a competing plan. That doesn't happen in sub five. It cannot happen in sub five. It's not allowed in sub five, another benefit of sub five from the debtor's perspective. But in chapter, in, in traditional chapter 11, uh, while the debtor has exclusivity to file a plan for a period of time, at some point, if the debtor cannot file um, the plan, if, if, if the file can, if, if, pardon me, I get so excited, I stumble on my words. If the debtor cannot get a plan on file or confirm a plan within a certain statutory period of time, and I don't remember what it is, I never do, I gotta look these things up, but it's like somewhere in the nature of maybe five months with all extensions or something like that. Um, anyway, it, it will lose exclusivity. It could also lose exclusivity earlier if a party moves successfully for motions, motions moves uh, for the end of exclusivity. Anyway, uh, but most plans uh, are, are debtor's plans. The plan proponent is usually the debtor. Sometimes it's common, it's not uncommon for the debtor and the committee to be joint proponents. Anyway, um, a plan can be confirmed consensually if, and the test is right here, if all the classes of creditors vote to accept, and at least and if at least one uh, um, one other class, oh no no no, I'm sorry I misspoke. Period. All the classes uh, vote to accept. The next the next sub bullet was was starting to tell us. Okay, well, what does it mean 
for a class to accept? What does it take? And uh, you may be saying, well, wait a minute, what's a class? How are classes made? Next slide, I think. But let's assume we have a class. Well, it's right here. You know, two third. If 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 it's a um, hundred a hundred creditors, then um, at least fifty one creditors in the class need to vote to accept. And if it's owed, if they're owed, if these hundred creditors are magically owed a hundred dollars, then sixty six of them, I guess, um, need to. Uh, oh, uh, excuse me, the 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 fifty one or more creditors holding at least 66% of the debt in that class have to vote yes. If that happens, then you're good. Now, you're not really technically good because 1129 has like a litany of, I don't know, more probably more than a dozen specific requirements, but these are the driver. This is the driver. This is really where the action happens. Um, cram down happens when a class says no, a class votes no. And if a class votes no, you can still confirm your plan over the no vote if you satisfy this test, A and B. At first of all, at least one class has to vote yes. So by the way, the implication is true. You could have every class vote no except one and it's still possible to confirm a plan. Um, so at least one class has to vote, of, of impaired creditors has to vote um, yes. And the plan has to be fair and equitable. Um, and fair and equitable means that um, the, the um, absolute priority rule is satisfied or there's an exception. And uh, the other thing, and it's not on this slide, uh, but um, well, actually for present fast purposes, I think that's sufficient. Uh, I, I want to turn the slide. Mar Miriam, can we go and just talk about, do you, can you spare another five or no? Um, I could do five more minutes. I think that's oh. about it though. I have another five. story that I have to write after this, so. I like your stories. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> okay, so we'll end at 1225. Sounds good. Uh, all right. Um, so again, we, we assumed a way that a class of claims or a class of interest magically existed, but it didn't magically exist. The plan proponent gets to decide how to group the claims, but doesn't have a uh, carte blanche to do so. There are rules on what debtors can, what plan proponents can do and cannot do when uh, classifying, putting claims in classes and interest and, and equity interests in classes. Um, because the concern is, um, what's it called in poly politics? Um, uh, jury rigging, not jury, it's a word. Um, gerrymandering? Yeah, thank you, gerrymandering. <laughs> um, there's a concern uh, that, you know, plan proponents will, will gerrymander to try to get, you know, the classes, the voters that they, they want. And within certain constraints, it's permissible. Um, so anyway, the point is that, uh, actually, I think I made my point for this slide. Um, you know, the, the concept is that, that in the big picture, the classification of claims is something that people can object to. Um, you can object to 11, you can object on the basis we just talked about, but this would be a legitimate objection. Whether it's a it's an objection that is sustained or overruled by a judge is you know that depends. Um, thank you. So uh, traditional Chapter 11 plan, just to go over real quickly, uh, debtor has exclusive right. I, I don't know if I said um, 120 days. I think it's 120 days plus another, and you, I think you can get an extension. So I, th I think I think my number's right. Anyway, you have to file a disclosure statement, but there are exceptions. You, in some smaller cases, judges let you not file a disclosure statement. In sub five, there is no disclosure statement, which means there's a cost savings. By the way, in chap in sub chapter five, there is no committee. As a matter of um, default, there is no official committee of general unsecured creditors, which is another major, usually another major advantage to a debtor, although sometimes committees can be very helpful to debtors. So there's a whole process. The, the concept of 1129 is just one of the code sections that work 
uh, holistically with these other code sections to set up the whole confirmation process, right? You got to classify your claims, you have to solicit your votes, then you have to prove at the confirmation hearing that you have in fact satisfied the conditions for confirmation. Um, cases are expensive because um, I mean, they're, they're very bespoke, right? You don't pull this stuff off the shelf. I mean, like anything else in life, you might have a plan and that you've done in the past or you've been involved in the past that might be relevant and at least have a starting point. But, um, you know, it's not form driven. Multi-party and moreover, uh, multi-party in a way that where the debtor is footing the bill for some of the other parties. When there is an official committee um, appointed by the U.S. trustee, the debtor is the debtor's estate is responsible for paying those fees. Um, if you have a secured creditor who um, is fully uh, is is both is over secured, um, then uh, they they will uh, be able to get their fees paid. Um, motivation of the parties we we said earlier this is um, you know bet the company type stuff. And so people will go to the mats and due process. There's a lot of, um, you know, if you can have the best legal position that the most brilliant legal mind could make. And if you forgot to properly notice it to the other parties, you can go back to, you know, back to go and start over again. Um, and the slide was turned to sub five, but I, we are out of time now. So and maybe, you did get to talk a little bit about sub five earlier. So that's it. We got to mention it and hopefully people can look up more of what it is. It, it's a relatively new um, law. So that's our new piece of the law. Um, and send Miriam lots of emails saying how great this was and to please do a part two. Maybe we could convince her to do a part two. <laughs> we'll see. <'Cause> we'll see. <laughs> We, we got to, I think, the bulk of the, of the really important questions. So thank you everyone for joining us today. And um, please feel free to, um, I think you can access the slides and the, and the webinar from the Financial Poise website. Is that right? After the I don't, where, I don't know where it's going to be, but everyone that signed up will, will get notice for sure. And then uh, it'll be, live somewhere. Um, so it's available to them. Great. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank and you. Thanks, thanks, John. Good Bye. to talk to you. You too. Okay. Bye. Bye.